especially, but for me, uh, as in the visions, the great visions of uh, people like Jesus and Isaiah and Moses. And that's my background as a clergyman and minister for some 55 years in the United Methodist Church. But as uh, one engaged pretty steadily in what I'd like to call about, what I like to pretend and say is all of the gospel of Jesus and not just something concerning heaven and the favorable places of the whole, whole society. So it's in the process of that that I discovered nonviolent struggle, theory, practice in the 20th century. Uh, and uh, I was led to it again through the thought of Jesus. Uh, but then discovered that Gandhi was experimenting with it and had uh, created, in fact, a whole science, a political science, of making changes in the world, not by using violence, but by what he came to call nonviolence of satyagraha. And he began studying Gandhi, in fact, as a freshman in college. Uh, and um, since that time, have continued to read Gandhi and try to understand something of his life and work, and then to use it uh, personally and otherwise. So um, I'm back here at Vanderbilt and Nashville primarily because I was here in the 50s, for those who don't know that. <clears throat> here as a divinity school student in September of 1958. But at the time, my full-time work, which then became part-time, was traveling around the southeastern part of the country in the crisis situations as the momentum for the legal desegregation, for the community desegregation of this, of this region, but of the whole nation, uh, was warming up dropped out of graduate school to move to Nashville to become a troubleshooter. So traveling to many of the places that are in the history books uh, of the movements of the 50s and 60s, Little Rock, where I met uh, all nine of the black students and worked with them who uh, fought to desegregate Central High School, which brought up the National Guard and the federalization of the National Guard in Little Rock. So these were rather astonishing times. And, uh, and then uh, I lived in Nashville. I enrolled in Vanderbilt in 58, and back in the Divinity School, or back in Divinity. And then uh, proceeded to try to organize the struggle here in Nashville, the next steps for nonviolence, and the next steps for the struggle as a consequence. And we'll come back that, to that later. We organized what became perhaps the major movement in the year of 1960 here in Nashville. As a consequence, I was expelled from Vanderbilt, uh, not by the Divinity School, but by a couple of the trustees who were quite angry with what we were trying to do in pulling down the signs in Nashville and uh, speed up the process of desegregation. I make no apologies for that, and I won't make any, because any kind of any kind of repudiation of some facet of the human family, for whatever reason, I see as perhaps the worst evil possible for the human race. The rejection of any section of the human family, to me it does not matter uh, what our excuses are for saying that some people are inferior or less than equal. I, I take that as an insult to God and an insult to myself personally. So uh, uh, as we sought to desegregate, uh, I was expelled. It caused some uproar um, in the city and in the nation and in the world uh, for a lot of theological schools, a lot of universities. The 
net result, result was that uh, I went on about my business in the movement <laughs> and continued to work, continued to travel, and then took a post as a pastor in Shelbyville, Tennessee, which is just 50 miles south of here. And um, uh, Bedford County built the new building there for that congregation that needed it. Then went to Memphis, Tennessee, as a pastor, <clears throat> continued all the while in the struggle. So while in Memphis, I was active in the Birmingham campaign as an advanced staff person for Southern Christian Leadership Conference. I was one of the teachers and trainers for the Mississippi Summer of 1964, which we'll <coughs> I advised people on Selma and led demonstrations in Memphis, Selma, 1965. I was engaged in almost all of the activities as a, as a pastor uh, and as a volunteer, incidentally. Um, Martin King was a volunteer in this program. He took only his minister's salary as a pastor and received no remuneration for his work. Nobel Peace Prize in 1964, he put back into the movement the money for that the Peace Prize, he put back into the movement. This is not always understood uh, at all in the country. But in any case, I went on to, I continued to be engaged in the struggle until I was 74, when I went off to be pastor at the Holman Adventist Church in Los Angeles. But there again, since that time, 74 to 99, I was engaged in the struggle. Uh, one of the architects for the revival of the labor movement in Los Angeles because I teamed up with the young woman who was president of a local union who uh, hotel employees, restaurant employees, a foreign union, uh, did training in nonviolence and struggle. So in fact, actually, been arrested more often in Los Angeles than I was in the Southern Movement in the 50s and 60s. So uh, continue to do nonviolent struggle and participation while uh, as a pastor of a congregation. So I tell you a little bit of that to for you to understand that I'm not a I am not a I do not count myself as a traditional academic. I don't teach the class as one. I teach the class primarily as a person who continues to think he's learning about things and learning about life. Uh, I teach the class of, of a passion for getting people to recognize there is an alternative to letting your worst self hang out when you have a conflict. There is an alternative way of, of uh, walking through conflict, personal and otherwise. That there is an alternative way for the human race. Uh, some have predicted that the human race is going to destroy itself. Uh, I think uh, T.S. Lewis said with a whimper or a bang. That is, <laughs> by polluting ourselves to death. paying no attention to creation, to the ecology of the world, ecologies of the earth, um, so thereby have uh, creation rise up and hit us over the head and batter us, or on the other side of the world, combining our great scientific technological skill with learning how to kill one another in more massive ways than ever before. So those are the two alternative uh, the ways in which people like Gandhi and Martin King, but a host of others, poets as well, thought the human race, perhaps in your lifetime or, uh, or, or not, uh, will deli deliver itself uh, a massively fatal blow. So I have, a, I have a sense that there is a better way, that if you spend some time thinking about it, 
and reading about it and studying it, we can find that better way. The university doesn't teach the better way. That's part of our problem. Because historians almost know nothing about the way in almost every, among every people in every age, there have been folk who have organized themselves primarily around what we can call a nonviolent struggle. Uh, not even the American history books describe some of the ways in which this happened in the United States back in the 17th century, in the 18th century. So nonviolence is not, uh, while it is a term that has to be said was primarily floated and used out of the 20th century, it's not a 20th century invention. It's a 20th century discovery, like so many other things. Uh, that we benefit from in the 20th century. But Gandhi said that nonviolence was the best kept secret of human history. The historians have not written about it. Doesn't matter what age. The uh, nonviolence perspective that King brought into the American scene in 1955 find very little written about it, except in some philosophy, theological books that want to describe the thought of Jesus, but you will not find very much about it in the history books and in the history of how the country changed. But it is there, and it's always been available to the human race, and some human beings have always found it exploited it both personally and otherwise. So I have a great passion that if we're to save ourselves from extinction, we have to learn how to take better care of ourselves and the nation as a people, as a human family, and we have to discover that there, there are features about being human and alive that we can exploit and use in conflictive situations, both personal and corporate, which is one of the big issues that has not uh, yet surfaced in public policy, public understanding. We do not have to spend our $800 billion a year on wars, past and present, on militarization, on our defense budget, intelligence budget, covert budgets, and the rest of it. That's an enormous amount of money. It represents a huge wastage of human, technological, financial resources. That if they, those resources were used, let's say, in the area of health care for the world, you would lift within a decade uh, the well-being of billions of people. Within a decade, those resources were used to stop uh, babies from dying in the world in the first year of life, something like 14 plus million die every day, die every year across the world, 200 in the United States every day in the first year of life. That could be wiped out almost overnight. You get capture the attention of powers that be and decide that that's more important than National Rifle Association arming the American people so that we have you know, over 200 million guns floating around the United States. Uh, so I have a passion about that. And then as a, as a, a pastor and an active follower of Jesus, I have a passion about the need to establish a society of justice authentic spirituality 
Now I want to say a little bit, and then I'm going to say something further down the road about it. But when I use the term Jesus, uh, I want you to practice an exercise with me. I want you to drop out of your thinking and your imagination when I use the term Jesus. Any supernatural stuff that you have in your head about Jesus. All the dogmas. Born of a Virgin Mary, he suffered under Pontius Pilate, so forth and so on. All the dogmas. The dogma was about his being supernatural, which is the way a wide swath of Christians in the United States accept Jesus. I want you to think of Jesus as an ordinary human being. Think of him as I sometimes do, often, as one of the 10 or 12 extraordinary humans who've ever lived. And that the same stuff of creation that was in Jesus is in you and, and in every baby birth in the world. The same human stuff, the same life stuff um, is in everyone. Um, so I don't want you to see him as a son of God or anything like that. I want you to view him as a historic figure like Caesar Augustus or Plato or some of the other ancient figures and uh, when I quote him, which I'm going to do down the road uh, as one of the beginning sources for the thought of nonviolence, I want you to see him as Jesus of Nazareth, uh, an ordinary man who did not live maybe more than 35, 40 years, um, but who was uh, a Jew in Galilee, uh, in, in uh, Palestine, Israel of today and um, who was an extraordinary teacher and was, uh, uh, has to be said to be one of the wisest humans that we've ever had in whatever generation or many creed. And that incident is an exercise that I like to work on personally. Um, that is, who are the, who are the men, men or, uh, and, and or women human history who we have to mark as uh, the extraordinary people or the ordinary people with extraordinary uh, challenge that they lived up to in a way. So when, when I use the term Jesus, I'm not speaking uh, of the dogma, some of which I myself dismissed uh, as being irrelevant. To understanding uh, uh, Jesus, period. So uh, uh, I urge you to practice that that exercise. But I have an extraordinary passion that Jesus is re represented representative of uh, the men and women who who moved right almost from the beginning of the stream of the family of man of woman to the present moment, and who offer us wisdom and thought that if we're willing to wrestle with it, might make a great bit of difference both for ourselves and our families, but also for the, for the world in which we live. And that is, that is I've tried to say, is des desperately needed. So I, do, I, I teach as a learner and practitioner uh, and a um, groper after truth and, and not as an academician means along the line you're going to find out that I have some very strong understandings of history, of life, uh, of what it is to be alive, of uh, my own past and of the subject matter. The emphasis I hope uh, this uh, semester will be on nonviolent theory, struggle, practice, history. Some of the names, some of the movements. With 53 to 73, what was what has been uh, 
classified as the civil rights movement as a kind of a paramount illustration of how ordinary people can organize against monumental challenge and do it in an effective way that creates conscious change as well as personal change. And then uh, using also as a model the women's movement of 19. 1917, particularly 1920, that lifted the consciousness of the nation in a, in a very real sense. And then the working people's movement of the labor union movement of uh, 1933 on that again. It's my thesis that the quality of life that you have enjoyed, whatever is your status, the quality of life that we largely have enjoyed in the United States is in large measure a consequence of those movements that I've mentioned that were largely nonviolent movements in the United States. The quality of life in the United States, other than the wealthy, but for the great masses of us, has never been dependent upon the wars the wars have not extended the quality of life. And the wars of the last 100 years have brutalized us more than it has set us free to be men and women alive and loving and seeing our world and loving our world, loving <coughs> I'll Say that again. The wars of the last hundred years have brutalized all of us far more than any consequences of setting us free, of lifting the health or raising the levels of self-knowledge or education in the world or in our own country. We're going to explore that because the notion is that violence is efficacious and the history books largely write American history from the point of view of war, war, president to president. The history books in the United States largely do not talk about the arts and the sciences, how we advance that way, or how religion has advanced us or how the struggle for the Bill of Rights has lifted the quality of freedom in the United States. Um, it's not generally talked about um, the way in which working people, as they've organized in organizations of their own, have made a huge contribution to the economic well-being of, of, of people and families in Los Angeles, in California, where I've lived for 33 years now. Um, there's a running quarrel the last three, four years because the universities, the state universities, UC, LA, and Berkeley, uh, have uh, um, departments on labor and work. And the state legislature, these are funded in the UC. But the present governor has uh, three times vetoed that budget and done it again this year. And some of the comments are well, uh, uh, the study of work is not important as a subject matter. The study of work conditions or safety or the study of labor unions or working families, that's irrelevant. Uh, I, I, saw, I spent the last two or three weeks in LA, so I saw some of that discussion going on because the budget uh, gets passed a few days ago and the governor is vetoing all the items. But anyway, the, the point uh, I'm making is that whether we know it or not, out of the movement of the 30s, 33 onward especially, uh, quality of life was, was, uh, was lifted. And again,
again, I will try to document more of that, and then the civil rights movement. Well, my thesis is the quality of life of the great large numbers of, of millions of people in the United States who can speak of having shelter and food and opportunities for education and the rest of it have, have not come from the wars. So those newspaper letter writers in Nashville and Los Angeles who talk about the Iraq war is securing our freedom, that's a nice patriotic emotional statement but it is not grounded in history, or thought, or spirituality. It has no foundation in reality. Um, uh, and, uh, but of course, those kinds of statements is what some power structures in the United States want the American people to make. Because that way we can be managed, and manipulated, and controlled. We will not assert gift of life, the gift of creation. We will not find our own voices and do what Thomas Jefferson and Thomas Paine and others thought would happen, namely that the people would be empowered in the United States to govern themselves and to withdraw consent from government when government was failing to uphold the rights of all humankind, of all human beings in this country. That has not happened. Uh, it is not happening. Uh, I'll say it. Uh, I'll say it more. I'll say it boldly in another way, and that is this: that if um, Senator Clinton and uh, Rumsfeld, George Bush, and Richard, uh, Cheney, and the uh, Wall Street Journal, and CNN did not know the war in Iraq was a monumental mistake, I ask as an ordinary person and as a preacher, pastor, how is it they didn't know that? I knew it. I knew it without reservation. If they didn't know that the Iraqi people would not welcome us as liberators, as Rumsfeld said, how is it they could make that kind of a statement? That's a statement of ignorance. Can, could not then be justified, and of course now is being repudiated after almost six years of it. Uh, I knew better than that, um, and I know better than that. And if they did not know better, where, where has been their learning? Where have they been in the last 30 or 40 years in the United States? I, I have a um, great drive to insist that if you're going to do, if you're going to have a better world, you have to do rightly with people. You yeah, must do justice. You must create communities where there is inclusion of people. You must have a spirit that there are no intractable human problems or disorders or diseases that any problem is a problem to tackle from the point of view of can we find the solution? Can we heal it? Can we heal ourselves in the midst of it? Not as a way of escaping by pretending that the problem is intractable. The progress and the change that the human race has gone across a million years has not come about by pretending, as an example, that poverty in the United States is immutable. It cannot be changed. That's nonsense. Too many people who came to these shores poor um, have, with help from family and community and church and their own ingenuity, uh, changed their their poverty. We're going to we're going to talk about that. All right. So I. I made this opening uh, this evening, not so much as a lecture, but as kind of a diatribe on my part to uh, 
we'll let you know a little bit of where I come from and what uh, I'm, I'm hoping to see accomplished in this, uh, in this 13 weeks that we have, the 13 sessions that we have for class. All right, um, are there questions or comments of any of this? You can disagree with me by all odds, and I won't uh, plan to flunk you in any way. <laughs> done your work. Yes, sir. Um, what was the name of the church that you passed your children in? All the real. 1960, uh, 1960, 1962. Uh, I think it was Green Chapel, I'm not sure. Maybe. Is there such a church in Shelby? I'm not sure. Yeah, I, 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 I've had to look that up because I uh, don't really remember the name of the church. Hi. You see the class, requi class required readings. Are there any questions about that? A Force More Powerful by Ackerman and Duvall. Uh, it's a paperback book that came out maybe about 2000, 2001. It is, in my knowledge, the first book, and I could be mistaken about this, but it is the first book that I know of in the English language that has tried to write about a nonviolent struggle in the 20th century. And some of what's in that book you will not have seen in a single periodical in the United States. And they spent a fair amount of time in research. They had research assistants all over the world. And what this book tries to do is, is one, it tries to describe how in every decade of the 20th century, uh, there were nonviolent struggles, one of which they report on, um, though the people may not have called it a nonviolent struggle, but in which basically the uh, movement, uh, let's say 1905 uh, Russia, uh, uh, tried to stay away from violent action, but sought never, nevertheless to organize to bring about change in that case in the Tsar's attitude towards the people, his dictatorship, uh, his uh, arrogance in uh, uh, being the primary ruler, the uh, sole ruler of uh, the people of, of Russia. But, uh, so that's described there in 1905. So in every decade, uh, that book documents a story of a struggle in which nonviolence was the major feature. In some cases, as you read it, you will see that some elements of violence cropped up. And that's an important point, which I'll come back to, that the folk who talk about the need for revolution do not seem to understand that any kind of serious revolution must be primarily nonviolent. There can be violent elements in it, but if the violent elements dominate and dictate the spirituality, the psychology, the social theory, that, that that revolution will destroy. There are other revolutions than violent revolutions. There are cultural revolutions. There are revolutions of music. And, that, uh, and so um, the um, uh, violence is not the only way to create change. It does not create efficacious change. It is the worst way. It fails more than it succeeds. We'll be coming back to that. So that's one book. The um, second book of the speeches by of Martin Luther King Jr., um, uh, edited by um, James Washington. And these are speeches that the book calls uh, Help to Change the World. And we'll, 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 we'll be talking about some of that later. It is not known by your generation or by the nation that in the 50s and 60s, Martin King was the best known human being in the United States and around the world. When I traveled in Africa the first time in 1956, I found uh, in villages along Lake Victoria, in Uganda, Africa, pictures of Martin King in village huts along the way. It's a major question I got as a young man. Uh, 
from South Africans who I'm trying to visit to uh, for myself. Um, was Benton, he was also the most hated man when he was assassinated, the most hated man in the United States. But it's a, an excellent book, um, and you will see that many of the points that he makes are points that are still relevant in various ways today. Some of the problems have not been resolved by any means. But he laid out something of the philosophy of the movement of the civil rights movement. Then, um, what else are the texts that he these? Oh, The Children by David Helpestad. I, I, I included it in, though um, uh, Vanderbilt's the only place I've ever used that text. Um, David Halberstam was a cub reporter in 1960 here in Nashville for the National Banner, uh, who matured to be one of the major journalists of the nation, tours of duty in other parts of the world, won a Pulitzer Prize for his book on Vietnam. President Johnson asked the New York Times to pull David out of Vietnam because of the reporting they did that was accurate, balanced. Unlike the newspapers we read today where you can hardly read such a report. I want to go back and compare some of his dispatches, which the dispatch, dispatches from Iraq, you see the massive difference. That time journalism had a fraternal value system in which Balance, who, what, when, where, and accuracy were very important for news stories. And all didn't do it, but I read such reports. I read such papers in the New York Times. I started reading in 1943 as a sophomore in high school. Uh, and it's very different from today. Today I can hardly read it. There's such a vast difference between then and now. Because journalism has become entertainment propaganda or whatever power structures uh, the, the journalist works for by and large. And I hate saying that. And I feel uh, that it's shameful I have to say it, but it is, I think, true by and large. But this book was uh, David's 30-year project. He determined as a cub reporter reporting on the first sit-ins in Nashville in February of 1960. And he wanted one day to write a book on it. So that book is the result. So it follows about 10 people from the Nashville movement to the Selma movement, to the Freedom Ride, and so forth and so on. Um, I'm wanting you to be sure that you've read the 345, first 345 pages is what I, if I remember it right. Right, but that book, if you don't want to read after that, that's okay with me. I'm not going to hold you responsible for it. First, I'm pretty sure the ending of, oh, at the, at the climax of the Selma movement with Bernard Lafayette, one of the people who helped to put that movement together in 1965, that's where I want you to end. It's an 800 page book, so I can cut it. <coughs> Uh, then um, the origin, uh, uh, the origins of the origin of the civil rights movement by Alden Morris has not yet arrived. It did not get ordered uh, last month, uh, but it's one of the best books that I know of that, that summarizes what a movement has to be about. Um, uh, he's a sociologist, was at the University of uh, at Northwestern University, as I recall. He wrote this book in 1974. So those, those are the, those are the, the part. next page, you'll see some of the recommended, recommended readings, and it's going to be put. These are going to be put on reserve. Many minds, one heart by Wesley C. Hogan is a new book, just in 2007, and Wesley Hogan has tried to write a document on the dream and vision of the Student Nonviolent uh, Coordinating Committee for uh, a New America. Uh, and she, she, it's a, it's a well-read book, a good book. A lot of mistakes, but most of these books have mistakes in them. Uh, so um, just to say that. 
and but when I say mistakes, I don't mean necessarily. It's let me say it another way. When you're in the midst of any kind of serious social movement, a political movement, it's hard to remember all the details. And some people will know the, some of the details, and other people will not. Historians take many times what they first heard, and it may only be a piece of it. David Halberstam, as a veteran journalist, old line, 1958 training, 1950s, Harvard, uh, Harvard University Journalism major, uh, old traditional training as a journalist, um, uh, makes the fewest mistakes. But even there, there are detailed errors that I know about, especially about my own life. <laughs> but over and on, over and over and over and beyond that, the books, the book is an excellent book of uh, the children. And Hogan's book is in, in the same category. Uh, there, I, I, I found out that there are always mistakes in these books. Parting the Waters is, is one of the best books up until that time. That was maybe 1966 or 67 that, when that book came out. All right, so there's a set of books. Now, requirements, required readings, class lectures, conversations, videos, guest lectures, and other handouts. And I'm also adding to that class participation. With this number of people, we can talk. So I want you to begin to find your voice and, uh, and plan to raise it in different ways, either with the reading material, with me, with class, uh, conversation, and whatnot. Raise questions, talk. Uh, I want you to think about these matters. Uh, and think hard about them. Three critical papers that I that uh, can be called your reflection papers. You see that there's a change on the on the dates that these are due. They are due September 25th, October 16th instead of the 23rd. Those are the midterm grade that the undergraduate uh, arts and science has to have, and then November 27th. Um, imagine a conversation. Maybe you can ignite your conversation with people not in the class or with someone in the class. And cre creatively engage the issues, the people, the ideas. I should add also the books. Give special attention to nonviolence. And if you've had an experience of violence, whatever it might be, however you have dealt with it, you might want to uh, include that in one of these papers or include something of its consequences or psychology or impact in your, your conversation. The final research and summary paper, 10 to 15 pages on a single event. I am deliberately rejecting um, um, any re final reports on um, Cesar Chavez or the women's movement other than, than 1917. Or the disabled movement, or the impaired movement, uh, or gay and lesbian. I want this primarily on these three entities um, uh, as, as a way of uh, focusing your attention on them. A paragraph about your papers due November 13th. It could be a half paragraph work on it. And then that paper is due the last day of class, which is December the 11th. Yes? In terms of the readings, are you going to provide some sort of timeline telling us like what to read, like when, like in terms of the order of books? Yes, I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you uh, uh, the, the class by class session will have more outline on the readings. For sure, she has class late. So. Yes. Can we join you? Yes, please. Do. Pick up one of those two page sheets.
Any other questions or comments on this? The other requirement, the final exam. Yes. I was wondering if our code CD ain't available in the code store for fire reasons. They're in the bookstore. They are not listed under religious studies. They're listed under Divinity 3950. All right, thank you. All three of the books are there. The Origins book has been ordered. Perhaps, uh, Monique, you can go ahead and stand and introduce and make what remarks you want to. We have three fellows, and I want them to introduce themselves to you. Uh, we'll be dividing you up in all three groups. Hello, everyone. My name is Monique Moultrie. I am a fifth year doctoral student in the Graduate Department of Religion here at Vanderbilt. And my email address is on the syllabus, so if you have any questions, um, once the third teaching fellow comes in, we'll... Amy is Well, we're going to divide up, and um, we'll be sending you an email so that you know who is your respective TA. I'm Elizabeth Williams. I'm, if you're fifth, I thought I was fifth. That makes me sixth year <laughs> PhD student, wishful thinking. Uh, my specialty is political philosophy, uh, more specifically contemporary theories of liberalism. So, uh, like she said, I'll send you an email once we figure out who's going to be in my section, and we'll get to know each other better later. I'm Amy McCullough. I am a third year PhD student in the homiletics department, which is an unusual department to be in, to be teaching this class. Um, but I took Dr. Lawson's class last semester and have a long standing interest in nonviolence as a United Methodist minister. Uh, and I, my email address is on your list, but it is not quite right. You'll notice that there's only one L in McCullough. Okay. So they'll be back in touch with you in various ways, perhaps in the next week or so, uh, as we get the full roster. Uh, all. all right, any other questions that thus far? I think I've covered last requirements. Final exam I did not talk about. Um, because I sort of consider this class a 101 kind of class about nonviolence. Uh, I consider it a kind of a 101 class on the civil rights movement. And some of what I uh, <coughs> describe in the civil rights movement, I've seen in no books yet. So uh, I want you to know these things uh, and something about them. I, I want you to know um, definitions of violence and nonviolence and so forth, so that you can uh, have that in your head. And my own sense in this is that one of the best ways of holding you responsible is by having a final exam. So we will have a final exam. There'll be no trick questions in it. It'll be a straightforward exam. There will be many opportunities to, uh, uh, to uh, really uh, do very, very well. There'll be true and false. There'll be matching. There'll be completion sections. There'll be one sentence answers. There will probably be a choice of one longer essay in the blue book. But then most of the questions of essay type will be very short, two, three sentences. I'm going to give you a rundown of what I think to be the chronological length of the, what I call the civil rights movement. That's not to say that there's not anything that's not gone on since then. But it's to say that I define movement uh, in larger terms than the, just the way in which it's described oftentimes. I, I would like you to know what that is. I do not think the civil rights movement is continuing today. As an example. I think there's almost no resistance in the United States against racism, sexism, poverty, greed, or violence. Power structures want us to sleep. Yes. Um, do you know about the time that you uh, date for the final? Excuse me? The, about the time when the date for the final be announced. 
Uh, we're not sure, but the last day of exams is December 19th, I think. And we're going to find out. Um, we have probably not yet been to assign the date and the time and the place, and so we'll, we'll try to stay on top of that. All right, any, any questions about that? Yes, sir. On the uh, additional requirements for a grad student, yeah. the number one, the reflection paper, is that the same as uh, number two on the class requirements, the critical paper, except it just needs to be nine to ten pages instead of three to five? Yes, that's right. That's the same as number two. And for the graduate students, that is three of those three reflection papers. Beg pardon? Yeah, it's the same same amount of reflection papers. Okay. Yeah. Same dates. Okay. And the politics of nonviolent action will be ordered so that it's in the bookstore for those of you who want to buy it. It is the classic document on uh, the organization of nonviolent action theory. All right, anything else on that? Yes? Hi. Exactly what do the reflection papers entail? Is it open-ended, or will we receive a question for them? No, you won't have any questions. You do it from the inside of your own life okay. and thought. As you read, as you participate in the class, as you hear, um, and then you pose, you can do it, uh, you can organize it around your own theme and thought. But what, I, what we want to hear, or what we want to see mostly, is that you are uh, fussing over the material, over the process. You do this creatively, do it, do it negatively, but, but that you wrestle with it. Inwardly and intellectually and otherwise. All right, any other comments, questions? All right, um, before we do a video on India, because the force more powerful, um, uh, Ackerman and Duvall, with the help of Stephen, Stephen York, a, um, a um, filmmaker, did do a series of six pieces out of the book for uh, PBS broadcast it and uh, at all uh, back in 2000, what, 2001, 2002, I don't remember exactly when. So we're going to use those six videos uh, as a way of helping to reinforce um, the ideas in the book itself. But before that, have we passed out these cards? Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Do you all see what we want on the cards? Um, can you see that? Yeah, the center light is not on, but uh, if you will please use the card and uh, then leave the card on the table here or, uh, or on that stand there. All right, let, um, let me... Um, very quickly um, use some terms and then try to define them so that um, we might be on the same page as we talk. Um, Nonviolence is spelled as one word. Nonviolent, nonviolence. There's no hype. For, for many of us who uh, count ourselves as practitioners, it's, it's, it's the way we make the word, uh, coming primarily from Gandhi. There are many misconceptions about nonviolence. And on the American scene, um, invariably, we have, we have been raised um, subtly, but also overtly, with the notion that violence 
is practical and is the best way to solve problems. So to say nonviolence or to write about nonviolence and to talk about nonviolence uh, in the United States is, is still um, a strange experience. People think you're off your rockers. So um, there are there are misconceptions about it. It is not seen as a political science theory or theory in practice that has been tested and tried, that has emerged in the 20th century. As I've said earlier, people will not know the book of Force More Powerful or those incidents there. One of the revisions of history that's being written already is that President Reagan in the 1980s, um, with the military escalation that we engaged in, um, caused the Cold War to end in the communist west, the eastern part of the Europe, which was largely authoritarian and communist, uh, to collapse. That's a lie. That is a revision of history that has no validity in the reality. If there's a single figure who, more than any other figure, caused the ending of the Cold War, it's the Cal Kobachev, the uh, former president of the Soviet Union, and the last president of the Soviet Union, came into office saying, I'm going to change this society I want democratic society, I want an open society. Felt that the Cold War was a disaster for the Soviet <coughs> Union and would be a further disaster for the world if it continued. So he, he's the one figure that the long run world history will credit with if there's a figure, a lot of figures in it, that group of talk would be that primary right, but one of the misconceptions of nonviolence is that it is passivity. And uh, a few years back, um, uh, academic at the University of Colorado by the name of Warren Churchill wrote an essay called The Pathology of Pacifism. And so I will add another misconception. Nonviolence is not pacifism. Pacifism is a historic movement uh, that stretches way, way back in uh, the thought of the Christian world, for example. Uh, and I met the term pacifism in 1947 and rejected it for identifying myself. And I saw what I was doing was what Gandhi said was nonviolence. So it is not pacifism. Churchill uses in his essay the fact that by and large the Jewish communities and people in Europe with the rise of Hitler did not organize to resist. Um, it was a number of years before the Jewish resistance movement began to arise. By that time it was too late. But that kind of passivity is not what even the pacifist movement calls itself, and it is not what nonviolence is. Nonviolence is not passive. Nonviolence is not running away in the midst of conflict when there's danger and turmoil. Flight is one of the options we have when things get tough. But nonviolence insists that there's a way of standing and battling in the struggle. So it is neither passive nor does it run away. All the literature of nonviolence insists that a person has to have courage and character. 
no less than a soldier who goes into battle. One of the interesting sort of strange things about this discussion that I'm giving is the notion on the part of the people, if you, be, if you go nonviolent, you're going to get yourself killed. You <coughs> don't get yourself killed in war. As so though if you're in Iraq as a soldier, you uh, are not aware that you're facing injury, mayhem, and death. So nonviolence, violence requires courage uh, and the recognition that you can be injured, you can sacrifice your life in the midst of it. Uh, 